drink on me. Thank you. So, I heard you're one of the best calculus treasure hunters out there. Buddy, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just a retired brown man. Now leave me alone. That's unfortunate, but I think you should listen to what I have to say. I'm not interested. What if I told you it was about the lost treasures of calculus? Go on, I'm listening. I see I have your attention, but before I can give you any details, I need to see if you still got it. So here, in my pocket, I have a calculus test for you to take. Fair enough. Ah, uh, basic antiderivatives and the limit of a sum. I remember my TTKs from my old days with Professor D. TTKs for this unit. We have the integral of e to the x dx. So the integral of that is simply d to the x. Very easy. x to the nth power of dx. Well, the integral of that is simply x to the r plus 1 over r plus 1. We have the integral of 1 over x dx. The integral of that is just the natural log of x. And then a to the x. Absolute value is not. Yes, natural log of the absolute value of x. Okay, moving on. Then now we have the integral of a to the x. So the, natural, the, the integral of the a to the x dx is just simply a to the x over the natural log of a. We have the integral of sine of x, which is just cosine of x. Negative. Oops. Negative cosine of x. And then we have the integral of cosine of x, which is just sine of x. Oops, I almost forgot the negative. Oh wait, no, no negative. Oh yeah, yeah, this is an integral, not a derivative. I'm so silly. Now you have the integral of secant squared of x dx. That is simply tangent of x. Cosecant squared of x dx is negative cotangent of x. Don't forget the negative. When you have secant of x tan of that tangent x, your integral for that function is simply secant of x. And then you have cosecant x cotangent x. The integral of that is negative cosecant of x. 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. You have the integral of that is simply r tangent of x. When you have 1 over the square root of negative 1 over x squared, 1 minus x squared, the integral of that would be just arc sine of x. And uh, although we don't see this one frequently, the integral of 1 over the absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus 1 dx is just arc secant of x. Don't forget the plus c. Oh no, that's a big misconception. If I did not add the plus c's, all of this is plain wrong. Plus c. And there we go, your integral TTKs. These are what you need to know. You've still got it, Mr. Donna Jones. Good luck. Danger awaits you. Please, Vishnu, do not let me have to jump off this plane because of this storm. I swear I will stop hacking on Fortnite. Mr. Donna! I can't get any closer. You're going to have to jump out of the plane. But first, you need to read what's inside of the vanilla folder. It's crucial to the success of your journey. Please don't let this be complicated. Don't worry. It's just calculus. Ah. Uh, ah. Conversion between limits of Riemann sums and definite integrals. So we have to write this function. The integral of x squared bounded from 2 to 5 as a Riemann sum. So to start off, what we have to do is figure out the delta x value. To figure this out, we simply use b minus a over n. Now our b value is our upper limit, which is 5. Our a value is 2, so our lower limit, and that's all over n. 
5 minus 2 over n simply gives you 3 over n. This is your delta x value. Now to figure out x sub k. This is simply delta x times k plus a. Now we know that our delta x is already 3 over n. So this is our, so that's 3 over n. We have our k that we need to multiply by. So it just becomes 3k over n. And that, don't forget this plus a. So our lower limit is our a. This is 2 plus 2. Now generally to write a Riemann sum notation, you have your limit as n approaches infinity of k equals 1 up to, so at n, and then you have the function of x sub k times delta x. Now, we so substituting all this that we just figured out into this notation, here's what we get. The limit as n approaches infinity, summation sign, k equals 1, n, and then we substitute our function in, which is 3k over n plus 2k over n plus 2, which is your f of f, f, the function of x sub k. You have to square this, because remember, this is x squared. And then you simply multiply it by 3 over n, which is your delta x value. So this is what you get. You have to write this. The limit as n approaches infinity from k equals 1 all the way to n of 7k over n plus 4, all of that squared, plus 5 times 7 over n. Write this Riemann sum as a definite integral. So now we're just working backwards. First off, let's figure out what delta x is. Delta x is equal to b minus a over n. Now remember, when we multiply by delta x, to, and when we are figuring out our Riemann sum notation. So technically, this is our delta x, which means b minus a equals 7. So that was so the difference between a and b is 7, because we have our delta x value over here, b minus a, so b minus a equals 7. Next off, let's figure out, let's work with x sub k. So that means 7k over n plus 4. Because remember, this is our x sub k. Don't include this squared because this is the actual function. 7k over n plus 4. Then we had to just, so there we go. And we know that this is delta x times k over n plus a. Now from here, what we can figure out is that our a is equal to 4. Why? Because Now, the way we figured out this a is because our plus 4 is right here. There we go, because it's, this is the notation. And since we have a as a over here, we can say a is plus 4. And we know that b minus a equals 7. So solving for that, b minus 4 equals 7. That means b is equal to 11. Cool. So now we know that the function of x sub k is equal to x sub k all of this squared plus 5 because here's our function squared plus 5 and that simply means we just have to know what our definite integral notation looks like which is just simply f of x dx equals now before we can do that let's write this all in f of x notation so the f of x is equal to x squared plus 5, because f of x sub k is equal to x sub k squared plus 5. Now we just have to take out the x sub k, we just want the x, so take out the k, all you get is f of x is equal to x squared plus 5. Throwing that into our definite integral notation, we get the integral from 4 to 11 of the function x squared plus 5 dx. And we are done. You're going to have to jump off the plane. Good luck. Oh no.
Something's wrong here. My sixth sense is tingling. This pool may seem harmless, but that's not water at all. It's liquid nitrogen. How do I get across this pool? Wait, what's that? Calculus riddle. Remember my clear words whilst we're apart. You are more toxic, undefined, and blue. Through, through rains flood the key fields of April, and springtime has the poisonous goo. Solve calculus you must, for it opens the path to the correct way. What is this garbage? It seems like I must solve this riddle. Let me review this topic in my head. Problem. So we have this table over here, and we just have to estimate the area under the curve using four equal rectangles. So there are three ways we can do this. So first off, the left Riemann sum. So let's start working off of this. Now, when we want to figure out the area of the rectangles in this, all we need to know that is that the area of a rectangle is base times height, right? Base times height. Now, all we need to know is that since it's four equal rectangles, we're dividing this into four parts, which means our base is just our change in x. So splitting this into four parts, our delta x becomes 2. So let me write this down. f of x times delta x equals area of rectangles. Now we want four equal rectangles. So if we have four equal rectangles from 0 to 8, and we want our bases to be the same, what do we, what's 8 divided by 4? 2. That means our delta x is equal to 2. And we just look at, so that means, 2 times f of x. 2 times f of x equals area of rectangle. Okay, now since we're looking for a left Riemann sum, we need to know our left endpoints. So our left endpoint is 0. Then, oops, then we go to 2. Then we go to 4. Then we go to 6. And then we go to 8. So working with left endpoints, we simply write it as 2 times, because our change, change in x is 2, so 0 to 1 to 2, that's the change in, so the delta x is 2, I'll write it this way, 2 times our left, the left side of our rectangle has a height for f of x of 2, 2 plus 2, again, the delta x value, times our left side of our rectangle, 5 plus 2 times left side, 10, plus 2 times, let me add a 3, that would be, the f of x, which is 13 in our case, our right hand, our left hand. You don't do this because this is a right hand Riemann sum, so don't include this. We have our four equal rectangles, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now you probably notice they're all multiplied by a common delta x value, which is 2. So all we can do is take this 2 out, and then do 2 plus 5, plus 10, plus 13. So this is f of 0, f of 2, f of 4, and f of 6. All our left, the left hand of our rectangle. These are the heights you get. Our base is always 2. So evaluating that, you have 2 times, so 7 plus 10 is 17, 17 plus 13 is 30. 2 times 30 is 60. So using a left Riemann sum, this is what we get. Now let's do midpoint. With midpoint, we already know our change in x is equal to 2 because, again, we have the, it goes from 0 to 8. We have four, in four, equal sub four equal sub intervals, so each base is equal to 2. Our f of x, though, changes because now we have to figure out our midpoint Riemann sum. So we're, now we look at the middle of our rectangle. So 0 to 2 is one rectangle, right? Now we consider this as our midpoint, because it's between these two values. So what's f of 1? That's 4. Then we go here. f of 3 is 7. Then we go here. f of 5, 12. Then we go here. f of 7, 18. Right? So this time, it would be 2 times f of 1, so the mid middle of the rectangle, 4, plus middle of the rectangle at f sub 3, or the f of 3 is your middle of the rectangle, so 7, 
plus 12 that's sub 5 I'll just write this down as well that's sub 3 that's sub 1 these are all middle middle value lights of our rectangles and then we have f sub 7 which is 18 let's work out this math 2 times 4 plus 7 11 11 plus 12 is 23 23 plus 18 is 141 that means with a midpoint Riemann sum, we get the area under the curve as 82. Oh, I'll talk about that as well. Right Riemann sum. So you probably noticed, you probably figured out by now that our delta x is equal to 2 because again, 4 equal rectangles, so our base does not change because we have equal rectangles. Equal, the base is equal. So delta x equals 2. That means this time we're going to have 2 times, and now we look at our right, the right endpoint of each rectangle. So we look at f of 2, we look at f of 4, we look at f of 6, and we look at f of 8. So f of 2, 5, f of 4, 10, f of 6, 13, and f of 8, 25. So doing the math, 5 plus 10 is 15, plus 13 is 28, 28 plus 25 is 33, 52, 53. Evaluating this gives you 106. So your right Riemann sum, this is what you get working with midpoint Riemann sum, 82. Working with left Riemann sum, 60. Now usually uh, the concavity is what really determines whether you have over and underestimates because you probably notice these are quite different values. So you generally, it would be safe to assume that midpoint Riemann sums are like they're not always, they're not the least accurate, but they're not the most accurate either. That depends on concavity. So if you probably, as you notice, you can see that this is a somewhat concave up version. So if we have a con, if we have a somewhat concave up function, taking the left hand, taking the left Riemann sum gives us this, something like this, because again, we are looking at our left endpoints with a midpoint, something like this. So here we have some gray space on whether it's an over or underestimate because you have some area outside of the curve and some area which is not really highlighted under the curve. So that's that's some gray space over there. But then right hand, we have one down here, one rectangle here, one rectangle here, one rectangle here. So we have a bunch of area outside the curve. Not all the area is taken inside is taken inside the curve, but we have area outside. This means the right-hand Riemann sum gives us an overestimate. The left Riemann sum, underestimate. And right now for the midpoint, we just have some gray space, but these are two common. So the AP exam will usually ask you whether it's an overestimate or an underestimate. And yeah, so based on the concavity, you can figure out whether it's an overestimate or underestimate or, or, or underestimate and usually drawing something like this helps you figure that out. I understand what I must do now. This riddle is so clever. It's still garbage. I know what I must do. Hello? Holy. These writings are so magnificent. Even though they seem so simple, they hold so much passion and meaning. I think I know where the treasure is. Wait, what does that do? Oh no, this gate is locked. It seems like I'm going to have to use math to open this now. Let me review the knowledge that I have attained from those hieroglyphics. To okay, open so this gate. in this scenario, we'll have to find a bunch of areas under the curve. So let's start off with the integral of 0 to 2 of f of x dx. So this is the graph of f of x, quite convenient. 
from 0 to 2, this is what we have. This is our left end point, right end point. So what, over, what we get over here is a triangle. And the area of a triangle is simple. So all we have to do is 2 times the height, 4 over 2. The area is 4. When you have 5 of 0, from 0 to 5 of f of x, uh, we'll just evaluate it from here to here. Now, obviously, this is this is going to take more. This is going to take multiple calculations because when we have a trapezoid here and when we have a triangle, so the trapezoid area is simply b1 plus b2 times height over two. Our b1, so we'll just take 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 this as our b1, which is four. Four plus b2, the delta, the case in x is one because from two to three, so that's one times height. Our height is a constant at a four over 2 equals 5 times 4 over 2, which gives you 10. When you have the integral from negative 8 to 5, positive 5 of f of x dx, you just have to, oh, don't forget, and before I finish this up actually, that's only the area of the trapezoid, but we have this area too. So this is a, this is a triangle, so the area of the triangle is 0.5, so, so we're going from 4 to 5, so 1 times negative 1, okay, the times the height, so 1 times negative 1 over 2 equals negative 0 0.5, so 10 minus 0 0.5 equals 9.5, that's the answer for this, so I'll write it here, okay, so when you have negative 8 to 5, what you do is you take the area of this circle, the semicircle, so that's pi r squared equal, pi r squared over 2, and then our radius is 2 because our di diameter is from 8 to 4 is 4. As our diameter, divide that by 2. You get 2 as your radius. So pi r, pi, so 4 pi, let's just write this in a more convenient fashion, 4 pi over 2. We can't leave it like this, though, because notice how it's under the curve. So we have to make it negative 4 pi over 2. And then we add this triangle. So the d base is 4, height is 1. And then again, this is under the x-axis, so we have to make this negative. So that's 4 times 1 divided by 2, and that's a negative value, so negative 2, plus the trapezoid area, so that's easy, we figured that out here, that was 10, and again, it was above the x-axis, so it's positive, minus this value, 0 0.5. So negative 2 pi, negative minus 2, minus 2.5 is minus 2.5, plus 10 is 7.5. That's the area of this whole function. When you have 0 to negative 4 f of x dx, notice how the bounds are bounds change. The upper bound, so the greater number is the lower bound, the less number is the upper bound. Don't forget this is a minus 4, not a positive 4, so don't mix that up. So all we do is we rewrite this. From negative 4 to 0, it's f of x dx. And then we just make this negative instead. It's a cool calculus thing. So all you do is you just look at negative 4 to 0. There's your, there's your triangle that we're referencing to. So we take the area of this triangle. What's the area? We figured that out. It was negative 2. But don't forget, it's a negative value. So we just make this a positive 2. So because, again, we take the negative value of the integral. So that's 2. So there's your area there. Negative 8 to 0 of f of x dx. Again, we have the same situation where our smaller number is our upper bound. That means we just take the negative value of our greater value as our upper bound and upper bound and our smaller value as our lower bound. f of x dx. Looking at that, we have the negative value of negative 2 pi plus, sorry, I'll just write minus here minus 2. So 2 pi plus 2. There we go. That's the area up from here. That's the area, that's the integral, that's the evaluation of the de definite integral for this. Now you have 5, negative 8. Again, same thing. Negative 8, 5, because again, we want to switch the bounds and then make the whole thing negative. And based on what we have, we have our negative, and then we have a negative 2 pi minus 2. And then we have this trapezoid over here, which is the area of that is plus 10. We have this over here, minus 0 0.5.
Evaluating this, we get negative 2 pi plus 7.5, because again, this is, how, this is what we got here, so the same thing here. And that means the answer is 2 pi minus 7.5. Now we have 4 times this. All we do is just, we find the area, which we already did over here, of the integral, just the integral, so ignore this 4 for now. So the, from 0 to 2, I'll have fx dx. What do we get? We get 4. Now we consider the 4 times 4, because we're just multiplying the integral times this constant value over here. So that gives us 16. Now you have something more complex. It's 2 times 0 to 2 f of x, x dx plus 2 times the integral of 2 to 5 of f of x dx. So that's 2 times 0 to 2. There you have that. So just simply 4, 2 times 4 plus 2 times 2 to 5. So that's this. So this trapezoid over here and this triangle here. Now let's do this math. So the integral of Five, 2 to 5 f of, x, f, f of x dx is simply equal to, we get this, our b1 is 3, plus our b2 is 1, our height is 4, and then divide by 2, 4 times 4 is 16, divided by 2 is 8, so that's 8, and then don't forget this, this part over here, so 8 minus 0 0.5 is equal to 7.5, 2 times 7.5. So this is our integral evaluation. These are our integral, eva integral evaluations labeled as i. These are the constants labeled as c, these constants. Solving the math, 8 plus 15, and you get 23. So those are those values. Now we have something different. Okay, now let's apply what we've learned and combine it with another graph, g of x. Now we, so now we take the integral of three, 0 to 3 f of, x, f of x times 2 plus 0 to 3 of g of x times 2. So let's look at this function, f of x first. From 0 to 3, our area is just simply b1, b2, plus b1 plus b2 over 2, and then don't forget height, uh, b1 is 3 plus 1. So 4 times 4 is 16 divided by 2 is 8, so we have a constant 8 there, convenient. And then we have the next one. Oh, sorry, this is a 3 plus, okay, yeah, this, that's 8. 8, and then multiply that by 2, because a constant of 2, 2 times 0 to 3 of g of x. So zero. To, the area of this is, so that's 2, we have a base of 2 times 3, which, or sorry, we have a base of 3, our height is 2, so 3 times 2 is 6, divided by 2 is 3, and then that's your area there, so 16, plus 16 plus 6 equals 22. Now when you have the, now you have something like this, and you're going to notice that there's a jump on discontinuity as we go on. So uh, from 3 to 5 of f of x plus g of x dx. So now let's just look at f of x from, th uh, from 5 to 3. So that's negative 0.5 plus... Uh, Alright, now let's work this out again. So you have negative 0.5 from here, and then you have this triangle over here. The area of this triangle is simply 1 times 4 divided by 2 is 2. And then again, we'll add this to g of x from 5 to 3. Now you, uh, let's look at what we got over here. So we have our 5 somewhere over here. 5 comma 5, 3 comma 5. So this is think of this as a huge rectangle where we can multiply our base times height, so our base is 2, change in x, and then our height is 5. And then once you do that, you get 5 times, so you, once you could do that, you get 1.5 plus 10 equals 11.5. And then again, once you do that, you multiply by the factor of negative 3 because, again, you have to switch your bounds. Negative 3 times 11.5 is... Evaluating this math, negative 3 times 11.5 will give you negative 34.5. Now, again, the only reason I put the negative 
3 is because this has to be switched, the bounds are switched, therefore you carry out a negative, so then you just multiply that by a factor of negative 3. There we go. Lost treasure of calculus. Oh, it stuck. I knew it seemed too easy. Hmm. It seems like I have to solve this calculus block in order to remove it off the platform. Let me just review this topic. So let's evaluate these integral pro problems. Starting off with the limit. Uh, so starting off with the integral from three to infinity of p to negative x dx. This is improper integrals, Nathan. Yes, this is improper integrals. So. First off, we have to write this in a different format. We write the limit as v approaches infinity of b to the negative x dx. Now we write 3 here, but we're substituting b for infinity because this is improper. Now taking the derivative, or sorry, taking the integral, you have the limit as v approaches infinity. You take the integral of the inside, negative e to the negative x. Don't forget that you're supposed to have a negative, negative value outside. And then you evaluate it from... 3 to b. That just means you have the limit as b approaches infinity of negative 1 over e to the b, because since this is e to the negative x, we're just writing this as 1 over e to the whatever power. And then we have our lower bound, 1 minus 1 over e cubed. Working this out, we just get 1 over e cubed. So this integral does converge. And there's your value. Working this problem out, the integral of 5 to infinity of 4x squared dx. So again, we do the same stuff. Limit as b approaches infinity. We're sub in substituting b for infinity. So we have b as our upper bound. We have 5 as our lower bound. And then we have 4x squared dx. This is what, always what you want to start at. And then you just take the integral of this value. So that's 4 third x cubed because, you know, plus 1 divided by uh, or this power, yeah, reciprocal, sorry, yeah. So that's b and 5, the limit as b approaches infinity. Now you're going to notice something different. When we do this, we have the limit as b as approaches infinity, and we evaluate this, so this is 4b cubed, we're substituting the b for x, wherever there x, there's a b, over 3 minus... 4 times 5 cubed over 3. Now what you're going to notice is that this, when you substitute b over in, b infinity over here, you're going to get a huge value. This is like pretty much infinity. This value diverges over here. And now that you're going to have to subtract that by a value that does converge. 4 times 5 cubed over 3. So you're going to end up with something like that. Now, this has no significance compared to infinity. So your answer, final answer for this limit is infinity. And because of this value, your, this integral actually diverges. Oh, I finally done it. Now to see what's inside this chest and know what the lost treasure of calculus actually is. Oh. Hmm, what's this? Well, that was a complete waste of my time. Uh.
how am I supposed to get back? 